Thank you. So we, we've now entered the part of the conference where the lawyers come in. Uh, I hope that doesn't draw you away. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer based in the United States, and I think our next presenter is also a lawyer. So hopefully we can keep you engaged on legal topics. So I'm going to talk about two issues that are sort of hot right now in the open source legal world. You may or may not have encountered these in your practice, wanted to just make you aware of them, kind of give you a background of what they're about and where I think they're going. So I'm going to start off with a little bit of kind of history of free and open source software as it relates to legal questions. <clears throat> so I think if you've been working in this a long time and open source has a free and open source software has a long history, um, in the initial stages of, of that sort of software it was a very small community of developers. The distribution model was pretty limited both in the number of people that were involved and in the way that distribution was done. I mean, you actually had to use physical media to distribute software to other people. So it tended to be a small chain of people uh, giving code to one another, of course, under a FOSS license, but it, not a very sophisticated chain of distribution. Of course, it is now gigantic, as represented by the, the left side here. There are hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of developers, all of whom are uh, transmitting code, code contributions through repos, which are getting re uh, uh, reproduced as forks, which are uh, feeding back to the repos. It's getting distributed through containers. There may be many different projects assembled together into a software build, and all of this stuff is being transmitted back and forth between any number of different parties, each with a software license associated with it. So I didn't put a software license on each of those arrows because there's way too many of them to, to present here. But uh, each of those have got some sort of software licenses associated with it. So now I want to talk a little bit about the function of software licenses. I think most of you are probably familiar in general with what the licenses are about and the rights and freedoms that they're supposed to give to the recipient of the code. But there's really kind of two ways to look at a license. Uh, the first way is which the way that which most of us lawyers look at these licenses are. They are either a legal permission or a legal agreement from the author or the creator of the software to the person who receives it. So that's sort of the legal way of looking at it. There's another way of looking at licenses, which is they are just an outline of generally understood expected behaviors. So in the early days of open source, free and open source, when the sort of small distribution model using physical medium uh, existed. Um, the second one of those functions was much more important. So there were not people going around saying, I'm calling my lawyer, you're not following the license. It was a small community. Generally, everybody kind of knew how they were expected to behave. They weren't looking at the license to see how it should be interpreted or how it might be used against them. It was just sort of, in the, as the Free Software Foundation has said about the GPL, there's a constitution of behavior and expectations of how that behavior will operate. So the legal interpretation was sort of downgraded in favor of the setting of expectations. Now that has changed a little bit. So I wouldn't say that the ex expectation of behavior uh, part of a license is gone, but the legal interpretation of licenses has become much more important and much, there's been much more focus on that. And the people who have been talking about OSPOs today have mentioned that, that the legal people are starting to look at things to understand what the law requires when you get code under a license. This is in part because the system of di distribution has become so complex and there are so many different participants in the community 
that you have a greater risk of having outliers. So people who don't follow the generally under, understood expectations that the license uh, sets forth. The people who violate the license, who don't abide by the terms of the license or what the license says they ought to do. So we've gotten a little bit more of an elevation of the legal aspects of these licenses, and of course, that means there's more lawyers involved in this process. Now, that affects contribution policies in interesting ways. So I think most of you that have been working in open source know that uh, open source projects often have contribution policies. And there, it breaks, it, it, uh, contribution policies are ones that have been set up to deal with basically two things. First, what happens when you have a user of the software who doesn't follow the license? contribution policy may be set up to address that. It also sometimes addresses the problem that has occasionally been encountered, which is what happens if you actually have to change the license on the project? Now, sometimes that happens for good because there's a new version of a license or that you detect a problem with the old license. And as Malcolm Bain talked about yesterday, sometimes that happens for the bad. The open source license turns into a not really open source license. Um, in each case, the question is, is the disaggregation of the ownership of the IP of the code useful or harmful? Now, there are three basic models that are used for projects to uh, 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 allocate the IP rights in the code that's reposited in the project. And I think some of you may be familiar with all of these three. They're certainly the subject of current debate right now. But they're basically this. One's called CAA, a Copyright Assignment Agreement. And that's where the project says to anybody that's making a contribution, we want you to give us ownership of the copyrights in the code that you want us to accept. So the project itself will own the IP in the contribution, and the IP ownership in that uh, project is aggregated in that one maintainer or that one project lead. Then there's the CLA, Con Contributor License Agreement. This is one that's fairly common in a lot of the projects that have been talked about here today. Uh, in that case, the contributor gives a license to the project of some scope so that they maintain ownership of the IP that they created and they give permission to the project to make use of those IP rights. So in that case, you've got a disaggregation of the, right, the IP rights. Each of the, the contributors retain their IP rights. The project gets access to their, those rights, but the, the ownership re, it retains with the creators or the contributors. There's also something called license in equals license out. It's somewhat similar to CLA in that the project says to the contributors, we use a license for this project when we distribute it out. We expect you, when you make a contribution, to use the exact same license when you give it to us. So the license in to us equals the exact same license that goes out. Now that's somewhat similar to the CLA model, but it, it can be quite different depending on the terms of the CLA versus the license out. So in this case also, you have disaggregation of IP rights. The contributors still own the IP rights in their contributions. The project itself only has rights to use those IP rights. Now, there are some pluses and minuses for aggregated versus disaggregated ownership. If there's a single owner of all the IP, then that single owner is the one uh, entity that's allowed to make decisions to enforce the license, to sue people who don't follow the license. It also gives them permission to change the license if they see fit. If they decide for whatever reason it's time to change the license, they have all the IP rights and they own them and they can make that decision unilaterally on their own. 
If you disaggregate the ownership, those two questions become a little bit more complicated. Uh, to enforce the license, you have all these different IP owners, all the contributors, each have pieces of ownership in that code, and any one of them, theoretically, can go and enforce the license against somebody who's not following it. It's the same with the change of the license. Theoretically, you have to get the uh, permission of every one of those contributors to make a change of the license. Now, that could be good or that could be bad, depending on your uh, perspective on whether you think changing the license is a good or a bad idea. Same with enforcing the, enforcing the license against people who don't follow it. So these are the trends that we're currently seeing in this sphere. Uh, the copyright assignment agreement is one that is becoming increasingly unpopular. In fact, the, uh, the one place that has had a long-standing policy that you had to assign your copyrights to them, the GNU project, within the past year has said, eh, we're not always going to require you to assign to us. That's a little bit of an indication that they understand that that model is becoming less attractive to a lot of developers. The contributor license agreement is still very prevalent and many people still use it. Although there have been some people that have raised questions about whether it's a good idea to use that model. So I, I have it as a little bit of a down here, not completely down, just because there is some subset of developer advocates who say that's not the best uh, model to use. License in versus license out is the one that's becoming much more popular. Many advocates are saying that's really the best model to accept contribution because it's completely reciprocal. The project gets rights, the same rights in the, in the, the author's code that the users get from the project itself. There's no difference in the rights to the project and from the project. Now, so if those trends continue, I think you're going to see much more dominant use of the license in, license out model for projects in the future. I think CLA, Contributor License Agreement, will continue to survive, mostly because a lot of projects still use it and a lot of people trust the projects that the, um, they will not misuse the rights that they've been granted by the authors to do things like change to a bad license or, or things like that. Uh, copyright assignment agreements, I think, are going to become less and less popular over time. Um, and that's mainly because you've seen some examples of projects that have done things that the, the contributors have not liked, which Malcolm talked about last week. And people are now saying, I don't think it makes a whole lot of sense for me to give up my rights to my IP if that's a potential thing to happen. Now, I'm saying that's assuming uh, that current trends, this is what's going to happen. That's a big assumption. There can be things that can happen that can change these assum assumptions in the way that people act. And I'll talk a little bit about that next. So now I'm going to talk a, a tad about FOSS licensing legal theory. And this is something that uh, we open source lawyers have been debating for 20 years very vigorously. And probably not a lot of you have heard about this before, but I wanted to introduce it to you, hopefully not in a way that's too complicated. So there's two theories on how FOSS licenses work in the legal world. One is that it's called a quote unquote bare license which essentially says anybody who wrote code gives a one-way permission to anybody who gets the code to use their IP rights. The second theory here is called contract theory. And that's a uh, more, more traditional model in uh, le the legal world, which is it's a two-way agreement. The author gives a rights to the user, and the user gives uh, um, the user gives uh, some commitments back to the author. Now, for most point, that's uh, for most people, that's not all that important. But it's becoming something that's going to be 
a test case here pretty soon in the United States. Now, the majority view of most open source lawyers is that it's a bare license theory, so it's a copyright permission that goes one way to the user. The contract theory generally is not adhered to by a lot of lawyers. There is a case in France where this theory was actually validated, so that's one little difference uh, between a lot of the other countries. There's also another theory that says actually both of these ways of looking at open source licenses could work. You could uh, use either, either of these theories if you ever went to court and tried to enforce a license. That has never come up, but it may in some, some point in the future. Now, why this legal theory matters, and not just because it's es an esoteric debate point amongst lawyers, it matters because depending on the theory that you use here, you may have different results. And the biggest potential result here, I here is who gets to go and enforce license non-compliance? Under the bare license theory, it's only the authors of the code and nobody else. Under the contract theory, there's potentially other people, in including recipients of code that is non-conformant. There's a case on that, which I'll talk about here in a minute, where that theory is going to get tested. Also, depending on the theory in which you're using here, you may be in a different court. So in the United States, we have two different systems of courts, the state and the federal courts. Under a bare license theory, you have to go to the federal courts. Under the contract theory, you can go to either state or federal court. That may make a difference in terms of the results that you get, depending on the theory that you use when you're interpreting these licenses. There's also some other differences that occur here based on these theories. What sort of money may be awarded as a result of the violation? What sort of order the court may issue as a result of the violation against the violator? And there may be different defenses available to the license violator, depending on the theory that is used to enforce the license. So these are so, sort of interesting questions that currently really haven't come up in any of the enforcement actions that have occurred in the past, but at some point they may become important. Now let me talk a little bit about enforcement trends. I think probably a lot of you know that in the early 2000s, there was a trend of uh, license enforcement, primarily in here in Germany and in the United States. So gplviolators.org was an organization that first kind of pioneered suing license violators. Here in Germany had a lot of success, again, in the early 2000s or maybe the 2010s. And then that was mirrored by some actions by the Software Freedom Conservancy in the United States. Again, they were going out and finding entities that were uh, distributing GPL code without providing the source, and they said, that's a violation of the license, we're gonna sue you. They got a lot of good results uh, as a result of doing that. Now, what has happened since then, as there have been some enforcement actions that have raised some questions about the uh, way in which you go about license enforcement. The two big cases here, both out of Germany. One involves uh, a, an individual I think a lot of you have probably heard of, Patrick McCarty, who is sort of famous for going around and suing people in Germany and asking for increasing amounts of money. He had a, a relatively bad setback uh, in a case against Genia Tech. There was also another case that was filed against VMware. And in both of these cases, both in Germany, some questions were raised by the courts about how do you establish that you're enough of an author that you can come to court and say to the court, please enforce this license. So if you have a disaggregated theory about who owns the IP, these sort of questions are gonna potentially be raised when you try and enforce a license, and you may actually not be able to get a result from a court if they say to you, you do not have the right author in here enforcing the license, or you do not have enough authors in here coming in to enforce the license. So these, these are raising some questions about enforcement theory, at least in Germany and potentially in other countries as well. Now, the most interesting case that's current is the one that was filed last year in California where the Software Freedom Conservancy 
sued Vizio for GPL violation. They said, I bought a Vizio TV. It didn't have the source code. There is easily established that there is GPL code in there. That's a violation of the GPL, and I'm going to sue you. That was done in state court under a contract theory. So this is really kind of the first time we've seen somebody come in and say, first of all, we're going to try and enforce the GPL as a contract. And number two, we're not going to even involve an author of the code in this lawsuit. We are going to sue as a person who bought the code or received the code as part of a product, and we have a right to that, and we have a right to sue as a result of that. I think that's the first time anybody has ever, as a user, sued somebody for a GPL violation or a violation of a FOSS license. Now, what does this mean, or some final thoughts here? I think a lot of these questions you may see come up uh, if you're maintaining a project, at least on the contribution policy stuff. You also see, it may see some debates about uh, how enforcement ought to work in the future. Uh, what happens, for example, what happens if the contribution policy trends Go are, are going in the opposite direction of the enforcement trends. So if the contribution policy trend is we should disaggregate as much as possible the ownership of the IP in this project, but the enforcement trends say uh, if, if the ownership is too disaggregated, you may not be able to get the right people in court to enforce the license, you're creating a potential problem here. So the contribution policies and the enforcement policies may be at cross purposes. Does that mean that projects may go back to something like a copyright assignment agreement? I'm not sure they will, but if we have a case where it becomes clear that that's the best model if you want to enforce, you may see people start reconsidering that. The other thing is, if you don't have authors as the person going out and enforcing the license, does that open the door for new problems? Now, the case in California that I discussed is done by the Software Freedom Conservancy, a very well-known open source advocacy organization that I think a lot of people trust to go out and uh, find license violations and try and get them corrected. But if anybody is allowed to sue, any user is allowed to sue, when they find a license violation, are you going to have people you would rather not have sue going about and doing that? Of course, the, the worst example I can think of is you've got the lawyer who's looking to make money off of a lawsuit saying, hey, I bought this whatever IoT device or I bought this cons consumer product. I was able to analyze the code on it and determine there was some GPL in there. I want to sue the company for a GPL violation, and I'm not going to try and ask them to get in conformance with the GPL. I'm just going to ask for a lot of money for that violation. Also, are there better ways to encourage compliance other than enforcement? This has been a long, ongoing debate, both by lawyers and community members, about whether it makes sense to go out and sue people for license violations? Are there other ways to encourage them to do the right thing and comply with the license? I think a lot of that has been going on for a long time. There are other knobs that you can turn to get people to comply with licenses, including pressure campaigns, uh, public shaming, uh, refusal to, say, cooperate with their own uh, contributions or their engagement with the open source community. That has been going on for a long time. If there are trends in enforcement that determine that that's not the best way to get things done, you may see a more of an emphasis on that in the future. So um, that's about all I've got on this topic. Uh, we're about at time, so are there, if there's any questions, I open the floor to it. I was wondering if, in your judgment, do these potential enforcement problems merit actually adjusting either the licenses or the contrib contributor license agreements in order to give somebody a clearer standing? Um, 
I wouldn't do it right now because I'd want to see the results of some of what if people have been doing. I think that you will find that um, if there is a result that comes out of some of the enforcement actions that people ultimately decide was bad or is harmful, their pe people will start relooking at their outbound license or their CLA or whatever mechanism they use to receive contributions and say, hey, let's turn the knobs on this to make sure we're not facilitating bad behavior. So yeah, that could happen. And then you consult with your lawyer. <laughs> then you end up having to relicense existing projects. Uh, Potentially, that would yeah. Be a problem with the Lilo mode, right. right? Although I I will say that the relicensing problem is much more of an issue with copy left than it is with permissively licensed code, because if you've got a permissively licensed CLA and a permissively licensed outbound license, it's not a huge deal to change the license in that circumstance, unless your CLA says something like, I will never change the license ever, which I'm not aware of a lot of them that, that, that do that. Some of them do say, I will only change to OSD approved licenses, and then you have a dependency on an external organization, or OSI approved licenses, I mean. Well, then you, you, you hurry to the OSI license approval list with your new license and say, please approve this immediately. OK, any further questions? Yep. How, how do you see the DCO, the developer certificate of origin? Is, is that just a technicality of, of the inbound uh, equals outbound model, or is that an own contribution policy flavor? Yeah, so uh, I didn't discuss DCO. And in fact, license in equals license out usually says plus DCO. Uh, the DCO is much more designed to be a commitment by the contributor to say, this is my code. So that's not really an enforcement question in terms of enforcement of the actual project, co uh, project code. It's much more of a, well, here's something that we could do in the event that there were a malicious contributor. And actually, the DCO is much more designed to say, if I'm committing this code to you and I work for a company that owns the IP, then I'm going to make sure that I'm allowed to give the company's IP to you. I think that's mostly the function of the DCO. So it's not really, I think, relevant to these sort of issues. OK, there are no further questions. In that case, thank you very much. Thank you.